so much, Yorinda. It's uh, such a privilege to be here. I, I have to say that this has been a dream to sort of have an opportunity to assemble a, a crew of people that so I, I greatly admire and that have been sort of fabulating alongside me in many ways uh, since I started sort of my career in this uh, academic business. So it's, uh, I just take a moment to thank uh, Foremost, Yorinda, for your for your uh, generosity in, in, in inviting, and then Stedelijk Museum, Studium Generale, um, Liebfeld Academy, and of course, uh, Jort and uh, Jorin and Viske and all of the team that has put this together. It's an incredible program. Okay, so uh, today is going to be a quite a, a kind of a shift in thinking around the kind of possibilities for. Uh, world building in the sense that I'm coming out of a field of, of design and engineering, uh, a kind of human-centered design practice, that's the, the department I'm in, and uh, a fabulatory kind of perspective in this context prompted me, in, as, as Yorinda just explained, to think about uh, the question of sort of what stories underpin design as a field, and then what kinds of methods might be possible if we were to tell those stories differently. So uh, drawing out these perspectives sort of from uh, a kind of, originally a kind of critical technical practice grounded in feminist techno-science, so people like Vincent Dupre, and then more recently the incredible work of Saidiya Hartman that has been inspiring a kind of retooling and rethinking of the legacies of design. So this idea now here that I'm going to hopefully uh, share with you today and unpack across a series of, of engagements is really about uh, the, the kind of collaborative project that design enables and as we reshape each method that, that it produces. And, and by design, I'm talking about a sort of widely understood practice of world building. So we'll see this in many various forms. And just to give you a very brief example, a collaborative project that I worked on the, over the last couple years called Making Core Memory was an, a kind of examination of fabulation in the early forms of information storage that operators at a Raytheon factory in Massachusetts had been weaving, in fact, by hand. So this is around the Apollo missions uh, guidance computer during the 1960s. They were lacing wires through and around magnetized rings to create sort of ones and zeros. And during a series of workshops that followed this sort of initial historical and uh, archival research, we were experimenting with ways of convening a conversation through the process of weaving together. So we invited historians of science, technologists, design educators, members of the public who are visiting maker spaces, all together to, to kind of experiment and, and explore through these stories of, 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 in fact, a kind of labor that has been deeply racialized, gendered, and ignored, and in, in many ways erased in the historical account. So during a series of workshops, we invited these folks to both make and then plug in their little quilt patches. So we created a kind of decorative uh, imaginary that housed these, these objects, uh, sort of a complementary form of feminized uh, memory work, the quilt, right? So by plugging in those, the quilt then kind of triggered uh, first-hand accounts to play aloud of this core memory work as well as kind of ascending accompanying tweets through an LOL Weaver's account. So in here, the LOL stood for not laughing out loud, but in fact, the little old ladies, right? These, these kind of pejorative terms that were used to describe the work um, of neither little nor, nor uh, entirely me. Uh, so they pl this, this kind of creative collective archival work was really depending on a material practice to reveal different kinds of uh, potentials. And this is about sort of foregrounding labor of production over the thing. 
And this is, this is uh, something I'm, I'm bringing to your attention because it underlies and practically kind of informs the program that we have today, which is asking this question of who, who it is that in fact gets to future. So future in this context is referring, stemming from Latin food to grow or become is, is now about that is to be, right? That is to, will be or is hereafter. So this kind of um, work in the technology sector of futuring is, is about a kind of a commodity fiction or what might be, uh, Katie Pine has described as a separation of context and data. So the idea that you're kind of removing the, the uh, tool, the technique, the, uh, the built and, uh, encounter from its worldly container. So institutions and state actors, they all alike kind of harness this language of futurity. This is something I would like to interrogate today. So this idea that we're describing an inevitability of technology developments and all of their ties to these kind of increased modes of efficiency or control. If you think about, for instance, sensor networks, right, that might populate public spaces, um, the way that they might gather, uh, aggregate these these um, times and places that, for example, service workers use a restroom or soap dispenser or those uh, the folks in warehouse works pack Amazon boxes, all of those uh, schemas that are kind of enumerating and counting the compliance of workers. So in these progress narratives around the technological future, we see these ne network systems have the capacity to sort of rework professional <laughs> competencies by kind of expanding what Sarah Fox has called this managerial vision. So within the design field, uh, it's, it's often the case that futurity sort of derives from this more teleological promise, but it also drives something changing. It drives an institutional rearrangement. So this, this rearrangement is something that, in fact, Sarah Sharma has, has uh, reminded us is, is kind of almost uh, not necessarily the, always technological, but also otherwise in this sort of introduction of, for example, yoga into office culture could not only relax the worker, but also ultimately <coughs> lead capital. So within this, this futuring, we see that, in fact, the language of something like empathy, one of the key components to design, is posing a relationship between the empathizer, right, the designing subject, and the empathize, that's that uh, subject who is encountering the work. Again, from Hartman, this is a promise to build connection and understanding, but in fact often is as a form of displacement. So in this, in this kind of working together, of a, uh, an, a displaced or altogether erased uh, body that might be rendered as other, we see that, in fact, today's cohort of thinkers is, 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 is actively retooling and reconvening a kind of critical question of futurity in ways that challenge and invert the conventional staged empathetic technique. So they're exploring a kind of sensorium of the present as a kind of an active engagement in what Sarita Mrute has called this form of attunement, an active sort of training the senses in order to reduce possibilities for action. So in this conversation, they're now helping us sort of work within and against these conventional futuring practices, and they're sort of also challenging the conflation of like critical imagination with kind of predetermined ends. So materializing these sort of non-endings or non-impossibilities, our conveners are taking us to sort of radically different sites, to the sacred sounds of northern Brazil, to the aftermath of Swedish plant life, of, to the uh, life cycles of menstruating organs, to the refusal politics of broken machines. They ask us to imagine a future, a future that is not just made, it's not just a result, a state, or a kind of thing, but a, a world in the making. So this process of bringing into relation a kind of fabulated means of means to beginning rather than perhaps an end. 
So I, I now want to turn to uh, uh, the first speaker uh, to think through how, in, in this sense, uh, fabulation in a context of, of, te of initially technological space is, is, is determining a shifting from noun to verb, and in fact marking a method that's not only a state of being, but a way of affecting and a way of mattering. So Sarah Sharma, whose uh, work I find quite inspiring, is going to share with us a kind of breakdown practice of, of that futuring machine. She's going to introduce us to these stubborn forms of determinism, of the techno-feminist thought, and the breakdown of a, a machinic control. So the, this broken machine will see a politics of possibility, but also refusal, and we're going to, in this vocalizing of the, the broken, she's going to illuminate a mode of, of resistance that incites both critique, but also humor. So uh, just a brief intro is that Sarah is a associate professor of media theory and the director of the McLuhan Center for Culture and Technology at the University of Toronto. Her research focuses on feminist approaches to technology with a particular focus on, on issues related to labor and time. She's the author of, um, oops, in the meantime, um, and currently working on a new book about gender politics of exit and refusal tied to contemporary robotics and AI, gig economy, and personal mediated technologies. So with that, give the mic to Sarah.